Imagine, if you can, a small room, hexagonal in shape like the cell of a bee. It is lighted neither by window nor by lamp, yet it is filled with a soft radiance. There are no apertures for ventilation, yet the air is fresh. There are no musical instruments. And yet, at the moment that my meditation opens, this room is throbbing with melodious sounds. An armchair is in the center and by its side a reading desk. That is all the furniture. And in the armchair there sits a swaddled lump of flesh. A woman, about five feet high, with a face as white as a fungus. It is to her that the little room belongs. An electric bell rang. The woman touched a switch and the music was silent. Hello and welcome to Spencer's Library. I'm Claudia and the machine is still going for now. In 1909, Ian Forster published one of the earliest examples of what we now call dystopian fiction, a short story with the title The Machine Stops. The Machine Stops is set in a future in which people live underground due to the inhospitable climate of the Earth's surface, and whose lives are made both comfortable and meaningless by the eponymous machine which supplies them with everything they need. Sounds pretty sweet if you ask me. Or does it? Spoiler warning. Spoiler warning. The story is linked down below if you want to read it for free even because it was written before Walt Disney got his claws on it. At least I'm pretty sure that's how copyright works and I have no intentions of doing any research to verify that assumption. You don't have to read The Machine Stops in order to understand this video, but it's there if you're curious. Anyway, you've been warned, I don't want to see a single complaint about spoilers in the comments. If you're familiar with the Enforcer's writing, this sounds a little out of his usual range. His popular novels are for the most part societal satires, with a good dose of romance and a sprinkling of politics. Oh darling, you're so handsome and charming and also a socialist. How frightfully exciting. Sign me right up. Oh, but don't tell Mama, she'll be terribly disappointed. The Machine Stops is different. According to Forster scholar Wilfred Stone, the story was not well received by critics at time of publication. But today, it's regarded as both a groundbreaking work of early speculative fiction and an eerily prescient one. Because this story, from over a hundred years ago, is about social media. Yep, you might think I'm exaggerating, but see for yourself. Right at the beginning, the protagonist Vashti is quite literally live streaming a video. The clumsy system of public gatherings had been long since abandoned. Neither Vashti nor her audience stirred from their rooms. Seated in her armchair, she spoke, while they in their armchairs heard her fairly well and saw her fairly well. What the fu- Ever since I first read this story, I wondered how this might have sounded to someone pre-social media, pre-internet, pre-smartphones. Because so many descriptions, in particular in the first part of the story, are just our everyday lives. And reading those descriptions was weirdly relatable, while at the same time being depressing as hell. She knew several thousand people. In certain directions, human intercourse had advanced enormously. <coughs> intercourse. At the beginning of the story, the main character Vashti, the aforementioned pale mushroom of a person, is talking to her son Kuno on what's essentially a video call using what's essentially a tablet, though Forster calls it a tabloid, which I find unreasonably adorable. Presently, she could see the image of her son, who lived on the other side of the earth, and he could see her. And yet, as many of us found out while we were confined to Skype calls and Zoom meetings in the isolation days of the pandemic, talking on video call isn't quite the same as being in the same room as someone. The human connection, well, it's there, but there's a barrier between people, a barrier that's necessitated by the very technology that makes talking long distance possible at all. So even though Vashti is talking to her son, she's not quite getting the full picture of his emotional state. He broke off and she fancied that he looked sad. She could not be sure, for the machine did not transmit nuances of expression. It only gave a general idea of people. At first, Vashti seems just fine with this barrier. She only goes to visit Kuno in person when he threatens to never Skype her again if she doesn't. On a video call, he says that he has something to tell her that he doesn't want to say through the machine. And while this gives off Big Brother is always watching vibes, there's no indication that Kuno is worried about being surveilled. Instead, he insists that what he has to tell his mother is so important that it needs to be said in person. He wants that direct human connection and he insists on it. Vashti is annoyed by this. 
she's much too busy with her online friends and her YouTube channel to take on the two-day airship journey to the other side of the planet. Unlike Kuno, she doesn't need that physical closeness. The idea that if people's basic needs and comforts are met, they'll stop craving human connection is an interesting one. In The Machine Stops, no one is confined to their room by law. We see this when Vashti leaves the room for the first time in an eternity to visit her son. Without any great cost or inconvenience, she can simply get on an airship and fly over. It's only her fear of the outside that keeps her confined. Her fear of the outside and of other people. She hates the very thought of sharing space with others. Even being on the airship with a small number of other passengers and exactly one crew makes her so anxious. There's one instance where the attendant of the airship steadies her to stop her from falling over, and she has a proper go at her for daring to touch her. When Vashti finally finds herself in the same room as her son, she barely knows how to greet him. And if Kuno himself, flesh of her flesh, stood close beside her at last, what profit was there in that? She was too well-bred to shake him by the hand. That's right, poor Kuno doesn't even get a handshake from his mother because she considers it not only improper, but positively frivolous. Which sounds pretty cold-hearted, except if you're German, in which case a firm handshake really is the pinnacle of parental affection. Angry and afraid is pretty much the default for Vashti, who represents the average human in this. She's angry at anything that upsets her world, and she's afraid of anything that's outside it. And I mean literally anything. She's scared of travel, she's terrified of nature. On the airship, she and the other passengers close the blinds so they don't have to look at the mountains that they pass. And she's even more scared of the natural world beyond Earth, such as the sun and the stars. But most of all, she's scared of human contact. She's so used to her life in isolation, she seeks refuge in being alone. As an introvert, I can relate. Her son Kuno, on the other hand, is a rebel. Since the story is told from Vashti's point of view, we don't really know what makes him want to break free from this comfortable but lonely life. But his yearning for human connection, his desperation to experience the world firsthand rather than through the machine, terrifies Vashti. Her entire life is deeply entwined with the machine and its technologies. In the story, we see quite a few examples of how they work. Some of them are gloriously sci-fi, like the bathtub that rises from beneath the floorboards and automatically fills with perfectly scented bubble bath. This becomes even more futuristic if you remember that this was written in a time when most homes still didn't have hot running water. Then there's the whole airships thing. I love airships. They're so quaint in a turn-of-the-century sci-fi kind of way. Early science fiction loves airships. They're everywhere, which makes sense because they were very much a thing at the time. In The Machine Stops, they're the main mode of long-distance public transport. So yeah, Ian Forster's vision of the future wasn't 100% accurate. However, when it comes to futuristic technologies of communication and entertainment, he was bang on the mark. Here's a list of things described in The Machine Stops that were still so far in the future at the time this was written. I'm starting to believe he might have had access to a certain blue box. Okay, I know I'm implying here that Ian Forster was a Time Lord, but for full disclosure and legal reason, I want to make it very clear that that's not the case. He wasn't nearly well-dressed enough to be a Time Lord. Though I wouldn't put it past, say, this dude to take him on a little road trip to the future every now and again. Where was I? Ah yes, the 21st century technologies described in The Machine Stops. Tablets, video calls, Spotify, ebooks, YouTube live streams, customer service chatbots, phone notifications, smart speakers and smart home technology. Creepy, right? All of this technology which serves to keep us entertained and at least superficially connected is there in the text. And for Forster to have imagined such a thing 115 years ago is just wild. And it's not just the technology itself. He imagined how connected this technology would make us. He writes that Vashti knew several thousand people. This seems so unremarkable to us today. How many of us know several thousand people online? Even if you personally don't, the idea isn't particularly out there in a 21st century context. I, only, 
follow about 500 people on Twitter. But that's still more than the average person of E.M. Forster's day would have had access to. The very notion of knowing several thousand people in 1909 is absurd, wildly unimaginative. How many people do you know who we've never met in person? How many people do you think E.M. Forster would have said he knew whom he had never met in person in 1909? One question E.M. Forster never answers in his story is why? Why is the machine the way it is? What actually propels it? Who profits from it? The machine itself? Has it, by the end, become a self-sufficient monster that feeds off the humans who inhabit it? Insert joke about AI. Capitalism. It just doesn't exist in the world of the machine stops. Currency doesn't exist. Work doesn't exist. There's no requirement for labor at all. No demand for productivity. Vashti writes and delivers lectures on music history simply because she wants to. Because it keeps her and the people who listen to her lectures not happy exactly, but occupied. Mentally occupied in a way that doesn't make them question anything beyond their immediate surroundings. The machine provides everything from the very basic needs such as air, water, food and shelter to entertainment such as music, poetry and the ability to communicate with anyone at any given time. So when we talk about how much the machine stops got modern technology right, I feel like we should also talk about what it got horrendously wrong. And that is the why. Social media, as we know it today, and as is described in the story, doesn't run itself. It doesn't exist purely to keep us entertained. It's there to sell things. Yes, you who are watching this on YouTube, you're being sold something. If you haven't seen an ad break yet, I'm sure you'll see one very soon. There's an argument that the machine in the story has evolved into an artificial intelligence that runs itself. And that would be another thing Ian Forster managed to predict well over 100 years ago. There don't seem to be any human components at all, nothing to suggest the existence of an engineer or a programmer or a governing body of any kind. The central committee is mentioned a lot, but always in impersonal terms, and it seems to be just another part of the machine itself. But modern day AI doesn't work like that. It doesn't run itself. It doesn't exist on its own. It's simply another tool for people to make money with. Technology serves capitalism. Facebook doesn't exist for the purpose of connecting you to your friends. Twitter doesn't exist to give a voice to the masses. YouTube doesn't exist for me to tell you about a really cool dystopian short story you should read. That's just incidental. This whole thing is merely a vehicle for the delivery of advertising. Yum. That being said, it really is very kind of you that you're watching this ads and all. Much appreciated. In The Machine Stops, there is no advertising. There's no product to sell. The content purely exists for the sake of being consumed. The consumption of content, of AI-generated poetry, of human-generated video lectures, does have a purpose, and that purpose is to keep people busy. If they're watching a video or listening to a symphony, they don't have time to start a revolution. If they're stimulated with lights and sounds and images and conversations with their thousands of faraway friends, they don't stop to wonder why exactly they live in a small hexagonal room with no face-to-face -face contact with other humans. They don't have the time to think about these things because they're too busy with their notifications, their video calls and live streams. The machine keeps them quiet. Social media keeps them quiet. And there's something else that Ian Forster was, if not entirely wrong, then at least a little bit naive about. The sort of content that social media facilitates. In his story, people watch YouTube videos or lectures, as he calls them, about Australian music or about the sea. They're all quite intellectual in nature and all about non-controversial topics that seem quite removed from these people's everyday lives. They use the technology to, at least in theory, further their thinking. There's no arguments, there's no clickbait or rage bait or trolling. There's a notable lack of discourse in the story. Okay, you know what? I wrote that sentence and then I thought about it some more and then I changed my mind. 
There's plenty of discourse even if we ignore the rebel son. Only the discourse is not concerned with other people. It's not arguing about people's lives and people's opinions and people's rights. It's all about the machine. Because halfway through the story, the machine doesn't quite stop, like the title implies, not yet anyway, but it starts to rattle a bit. The quality of the AI-generated poetry drops. The magically summoned bathwater is no longer perfectly perfumed. The food is moldy. And that's when the discourse begins. It's also when religion begins. So the world of The Machine Stops is not driven by money. The government is synonymous with the machine itself. And while there is mention of a central committee, it seems absent at the very least and entirely automated too. When Kuno first talks to his mother about his rebellion, he accuses her of treating the machine as a god. You are beginning to worship the machine, he said coldly. You think it irreligious of me to have found out a way of my own. At this, she grew angry. I worship nothing, she cried. I am most advanced. I don't think you're irreligious, for there is no such thing as a religion left. All the fear and the superstition that existed once have been destroyed by the machine. In this first part of the story, religion is presented as in direct opposition to advancement and progress. Vashti is offended at the accusation of being religious because she considers herself most advanced. Of course, her actions tell a very different story. The one object she takes with her on her visit to Kuno is something called the book. It's the only piece of old-fashioned analog media we see in the entire story. Whereas all other literature is delivered digitally by the machine, the book is just a book. Ostensibly, it's the manual for how to use the machine, which buttons to press for which function, etc. But we figure out pretty quickly that the book is more than that. Vashti turns to it in times of distress, and it's implied that the other people of the machine treat it in a similar way. At this point, her belief is more of a personal faith, something practiced in private rituals, a comfort that the people of the machine cling to, something that guides their lives. But once the first signs of decline and decay start to show, this worship of the machine and the canonization of the book are formalized. Those who had long worshipped silently now began to talk. They described the strange feeling of peace that came over them when they handled the book of the machine, the pleasure that it was to repeat certain numerals out of it, however little meaning those numerals conveyed to the outward ear, the ecstasy of touching a button, however unimportant, or of ringing an electric bell, however superfluously. The machine, they exclaimed, feeds us and clothes us and houses us. Through it we speak to one another, through it we see one another, in it we have our being. The machine is the friend of ideas and the enemy of superstition. The machine is omnipotent, eternal, blessed is the machine. This religious sentiment is not mandated by law, nor is it enforced by police. Instead, it's amplified by the citizens through the medium of the machine itself. People talk about it in their YouTube videos, in their lectures, or on the speaking tubes with their friends. Just like any popular movement today, this religion spreads on social media. So yeah, my first assumption that there is no discourse in The Machine Stops was plain wrong. But the emergence of religion, the emergence of a god that's precipitated by the beginning failure of the machine itself, that makes sense. At this point, the people are well aware that they have no control over the machine, that even if they wanted to, they couldn't change the system. All they have left is prayer. Something else that happens in the story. After Kuno has actually managed to escape the machine and crawled to the surface of the earth, only to be dragged down again by the machine's automated mending apparatus, is what we would today call a reactionary movement away from the deliberate acquisition of knowledge and towards a watered-down sharing of information. Those lectures slash YouTube videos, they're still going. But people are discouraged from seeking out primary sources or, God forbid, even do their own field research. Vashti and the other lecturers are called to move away from so-called first-hand ideas and instead rely on previous research. One lecturer, who's in favour of secondary sources, talks about how, when studying, for example, the French Revolution, one should look at 10th-hand knowledge and one should avoid 
direct observation at all cost. And in time, there will come a generation that had got beyond facts, beyond impressions, a generation absolutely colourless, a generation seraphically free from taint of personality, which will see the French Revolution not as it happened, nor as they would like it to have happened, but as it would have happened had it taken place in the days of the machine. I should point out here that I disagree with the fundamental notion of this. Forster seems to argue that good academic research in a field such as history should entirely or almost entirely rely on primary sources. If we're sticking to the French Revolution as an example, that means original texts written in the 18th century by those who witnessed the French Revolution. Hence why, in this dystopian scenario, people are discouraged from those sources, lest they should inspire any naughty ideas involving sharp blades. In the context of this story, this kind of works. But if we're talking about the concept of research in general, I think that both primary and secondary sources are necessary to get a comprehensive understanding of the past. Reading previous scholars' work is not only valuable but essential for digesting and processing information. The study of history is not just about what happened, but also about how it happened, why it happened, and how what happened is understood by various people at various points of history, and how that's relevant to us today. And for that, we need both the first-hand accounts and the tenth-hand accounts. Sorry, I got a bit sidetracked there. The point Forster's making in the story at this point is that people are being discouraged from thinking for themselves and encouraged to engage in religious rituals. They're encouraged to put all their trust and faith into the machine, even as it rattles, decays, and slowly falls apart. And that leads to them bearing those failures, making excuses for the machine that in the past I would have considered quite implausible. Then I had the joy of witnessing the British make those same kind of excuses for the pathetic failures of their own government, which they've kept in power for 14 years and counting. I'm not going to reopen the Brexit can of worms. I'm just going to put the metaphorical Brexit can of worms on the metaphorical table and then stare at it meaningfully. The people in the machine stops make complaints to the internal complaints mechanism, which is basically an automated chatbot called the Committee of the Mending Apparatus, which assures them that their complaints will be forwarded. Then, inevitably, their complaints are ignored and people become complacent. They stop complaining and they just get used to ever-worsening conditions. Time passed and they resented the defects no longer. The defects had not been remedied, but the human tissues in that latter day had become so subservient that they readily adapted themselves to every caprice of the machine. All were bitterly complained of at first, and then acquiesced in and forgotten. Things went from bad to worse, unchallenged. Things went from bad to worse, unchallenged. What a line. If you don't recognize that sentiment, I don't know what to tell you. Not to start a whole new discourse when we're getting so close to the end of the video, but my hot take is that when it comes to authors' opinions on their own work, they're usually interesting and worth listening to, but they should not stop me or others from coming up with our own interpretations. With that said, in 1965, Ian Forster was asked about the meaning of The Machine Stops, nearly 50 years after he wrote it. This is what he had to say to interviewer Wilfred Stone at the time. As to the point of the story, the point is, get back to the past and what is good in the past. The story contains its own statement, the danger of getting from simplicity to mechanism. Are you disappointed? Because I'm a little bit disappointed. Because there's so much more nuance to the machine stop than simply old good, new bad. The idea that everything old is automatically simple is naive at best. At worst, it can very quickly lead to a romanticized version of the past that's very popular with the sort of people who like to weaponize it in order to deny rights to the marginalized. To be very clear, I'm not even slightly suggesting that Ian Forster was a nostalgia-wielding Tory. By all accounts, he was anything but. Quite famously, he was a humanist, a progressive thinker, proponent of equality. Still, 
get back to the past is such an interesting quote in this context. Because it very much sounds like someone who, a long time ago, wrote a piece of dystopian fiction about a truly harrowing digital future, and then lived another five decades to see his world change so drastically, he must have felt like a bloody prophet. Between the publication of The Machine Stops and this interview in 1965, this man witnessed two world wars, the meteoric rise of the motor car as the default mode of transportation, the development of aeroplane travel, the introduction and subsequent ubiquity of the telephone and the radio and television. He saw his world get more and more interconnected in real time. So it's no surprise that at the age of 86, when he gave that interview, he was a little bit worried about the progress of technology. Another tidbit I found interesting about Wilfred Stone's interviews with Ian Forster is that apparently Ian Forster forbade him to use a tape recorder for the interviews. So this poor man had to memorize everything and then very quickly write down his notes after the interview had finished. So it's not too frivolous to suggest that in old age, Forster remained as distrustful of modern technology as he'd been as a young man when he wrote The Machine Stops. And in a way, I get it. I'm a millennial woman of that sort of generation that kind of grew up on the internet and kind of didn't. My family had a computer from when I was about eight, but time on the computer was strictly limited by my parents. I didn't really explore the internet until my teenage years, which were mostly spent on message boards concerning boy bands, TV shows, and hair care advice. Social media and smartphones didn't become a thing until I was an adult. The internet was for hobbies. Today, the children of my peers are growing up in a very different world. They're surrounded by social media. It's part of their every day. It's no longer a fun and exciting luxury. It's just there. I'm curious to see what that does to the way they interact with technology as adults. So, of course, Ian Forster didn't make the machine stops about social media as we know it today. That concept was so far removed from even the advancements he experienced in his very long life. But that doesn't stop me from looking at the story through that particular lens and from wondering what we in the 21st century can take away from it. I found an opinion piece in The Guardian by fellow millennial Ross Barkin in which he talks about a trend away from online spaces. He calls it a new romanticism, mirroring the 19th century movement that we saw in the wake of the Industrial Revolution. According to Barkin, we who once played with social media like my cat does with a feather on a string are getting thoroughly fed up with it, just like my cat after five minutes. And even though he, that's Ross Barkin, not my cat, never directly references the machine stops. His opinion piece most definitely evokes it. Science brought about these revolutions. Science compressed once unimaginable computing power into a single handheld device. Science now promises a great leap forward with artificial intelligence, which seems intent on replacing the arts themselves. Machines will now make mediocre art, music, literature, and even fact-challenged journalism. The amusement phase has passed. The modern creative class, beleaguered enough, barraged by two decades of digital technology that has radically cheapened music, television and cinema, is ready for combat. I'm kind of feeling that fatigue. I'd say I'm about as online as is average for someone my age. And only now it's starting to feel like it's too much. So what's changed? For one, we lived through a period of quite literally being locked up in our own hexagonal cells with only the internet for company. Whereas before, social media always seemed ubiquitous, yes, but essentially optional. During the lockdown, that was our only way of communicating, of socializing. Then, well, Elon Musk happened, didn't he? Like a great big meteorite of toxic pigeon droppings, he happened. And the machine, as it were, began to rattle. This is secretly a video about Twitter, at least a little bit, or X, as exactly one asshole calls it. Because if social media is the machine, then it's beginning to fall apart. The bathwater stinks, the poetry's getting a bit cringe, there's a strange humming noise in the air, and we all know what that means. In the story, we see the world through Vashti's eyes. And Vashti's decidedly not a revolutionary, 
Throughout the whole story, she doesn't rebel and she's disgusted by her own son's rebellion. She doesn't understand it. She's afraid of it, afraid of him even. She is the model citizen, the perfect cog in the machine. Her son Kuno tries to warn her more than once of the danger that's just lurking around the corner. Cannot you see, cannot all you lecturers see that it is we that are dying and that down here the only thing that really lives is the machine? We created the machine to do our will, but we cannot make it do our will now. It has robbed us of the sense of space and of the sense of touch. It has blurred every human relation and narrowed down love to a carnal act. It has paralyzed our bodies and our wills, and now it compels us to worship it. The machine develops, but not on our lines. The machine proceeds, but not to our goal. Vashti and Kuno are the only two named characters in the story. The complacent mother, and her rebellious son. Vashti's friends are mentioned a lot, but none of them by name. They appear in conversations with her, they clearly talk to each other a lot. But in the end, none of them matters. In the end, her son is the only important thing to her, and they reconnect just before they both die. That's right, no happy ending in this story. And the thing is, of course, that compliant Vashti and rebellious Kuno both die just the same, irrespective of how they lived their lives in their very different ways within the machine. Kuno knows that life outside the machine is possible because on his one brief excursion to the surface of the earth, he meets other humans who live there. He knows that there's life beyond the machine. And yet, all the way to the end, he fails to realize that dream for himself. His ambitions of liberation are stifled by the machine even if that is what causes its final destruction. In the end, he and Vashti die in each other's arms, which is really fucking bleak, so cheers for that, Edward. The machine self-destructs, and it's not entirely clear whether that's caused by Kuno's rebellion or irrespective of it. Either way, humans went wrong when they first decided to put their entire lives in its mechanical hands. Is this what's happening to our own social media machine? I don't think so. There's only so far a cautionary tale can go. Twitter doesn't run itself just yet, and while there's still money to be made for American billionaires, they're going to try and keep us happy. But the cracks are starting to show. These days, when I go on Twitter, my feed is full of rage-baiting blue ticks trying to game the algorithm by drawing your engagement, feeding off your outrage like vampires. It's either that or bots tweeting fun facts that are really just rehashed Wikipedia articles about things that no one cares about, or memes stolen off Reddit and Tumblr, or fast food companies tweeting into the void in a pathetic attempt to look relatable and human. Social media networks come and go, and usually when one dies, another one pops up. You sign up, you enjoy the new toy, and soon you ask yourself how you ever lived without it. But this time, it feels different. This time, when the machine stops, I don't think I'll mind. Thank you for watching. Bye. There don't seem to be any human components to it at all. Yes. There don't seem to be any human components. There don't seem to be any human components to it at all. Nothing to suggest the existence of an engineer or a programmer. Minerva, why don't you go have a nap? Not here. What goes on in your little brain? Come on, kettle off now. There don't seem to be any human components at all. Nothing to suggest the existence of an engineer or a programmer or a governing body of any kind. Please, let me get through this sentence just once. Just once. That's all I'm asking. You're gonna get your paws stuck in there. All right, you know what? If you wanna sit there, you'll just sit there and fuck the continuity.